Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're back talking about the cardiovascular system. In this section, we're talking about antiarrhythmic agents and calcium channel blockers, and this is part one. First, let's talk about digoxin. Digoxin is a drug commonly used in the management of supraventricular tachydysrhythmias, so things that happen in the atria, atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, and especially tachyrhythmias, so a, ven a rapid ventricular rate. Digoxin works by slowing conduction through the AV node, which reduces the ventricular rate, so even though the atria may be fibrillating at several hundred beats per minute, we see a very small number of those beats that are allowed to pass through the AV node and stimulate the ventricle. Digoxin causes an increased parasympathetic nervous system activity and may, increase, may decrease the SA node activity as well. There is some risk of ventricular fibrillation in patients who are given digoxin. And this is a common thread that we'll see, that a lot of the antiarrhythmic agents also have the capability of causing arrhythmias. Digoxin was originally used as a treatment for congestive heart failure, but it's no longer a first-line therapy for congestive heart failure. So if you see patients on digoxin, while they may be getting some benefit from the anti-heart failure effects of the drug, they're probably on it for rate control of some kind, not for heart failure control. Nevertheless, it's important for us to know that it is a positive inotropic agent, so it increases contractility, and it does this by inhibiting the sodium-potassium ATP transport system. When intracellular sodium is increased, this leads to an increase in intracellular calcium, which leads to an increase in contractility. Digoxin is renally cleared, and it's important to note that it's significantly protein-bound. There are some drug interactions that you probably don't need to know for your clinical practice, but may show up on a board exam. So quinidine can displace digoxin from its tissue binding sites and lead to a higher level of free drug in the serum. And sympathomimetic agents can also precipitate dysrhythmias in patients who are already taking digoxin. The most important thing you should know about digoxin is that it has a very narrow therapeutic range. So at 35% of the fatal dose, is usually where we're targeting our therapeutic dose. So for example, the therapeutic range might be somewhere in the 0.5 to 2.5 nanogram per milliliter serum concentration, while the toxic range is above 3 nanograms per milliliter. So as a result, this drug needs to be dosed very carefully. Often we draw serum levels to see what the digoxin level is, and certain drug combinations or other changes in the patient's status could change their free drug levels. Patients can develop toxicity if they have potassium depletion from diuretics or from alkalosis. And symptoms of digoxin toxicity include nausea and vomiting, vision changes, especially with yellow or green halos, and atrial or ventricular dysrhythmias. If patients do have digoxin toxicity, the first thing to do is identify and correct the inciting cause, whether it's hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia or hypercalcemia. Dys dysrhythmias should be treated with the appropriate drug, usually something like phenytoin or lidocaine or atropine. And if complete heart block occurs, artificial pacing may be necessary. In severe cases, digitalis antibodies, known as FAB fragments, can be administered to bind up the free digoxin. <clears throat> We'll pause there for just a moment. In case you have any questions, you can jot them down. The other drug I'd like to talk about, class of drugs really, are the classic antiarrhythmic drugs. And this is a whole lecture into itself, which we're not going to go into, although the physiology is very interesting. But I just want to outline the different classes of drugs very quickly. The class one drugs are considered the sodium channel blockers. And most of these are not drugs that you would give very routinely. Lidocaine is the exception, and maybe phenytoin, although as you'll see, we don't usually give phenytoin as an antiarrhythmic. But at any rate, these drugs are all sodium channel blockers. They decrease the rate of myocardial depolarization and conduction velocity. And lidocaine especially is effective 
for treatment of ventricular tachycardia and suppression of PVCs. So when we think about ventricular dysrhythmias, lidocaine is a very good drug. Lidocaine can be given IV at a dose of 2 milligrams per kilogram, and then an infusion can be run anywhere between 1 to 4 milligrams per minute. It's metabolized in the liver, as we discussed last semester, and we already know about local anesthetic toxicity. So things we would be looking for are CNS toxicity, like depression, apnea, or seizures, and this can be worse in patients who are hypoxic or acidotic. The class two antiarrhythmic drugs are the beta blockers, and we've talked about those already, so there isn't any need to go into them in detail in this lecture. The class three antiarrhythmic drugs, the one you would want to know the most is amiodarone. Amiodarone blocks the potassium channel, and as a result, it prolongs the cardiac depolarization and the action potential. Basically, what it does is decrease the proportion of the cardiac cycle when the myocardium is excitable. And that's how amiodarone works as an antiarrhythmic drug. Basically, all cardiac tissues will have a longer refractory period in patients who are taking amiodarone. Now, this is a complicated medication. It actually has some class 1 and class 2 and even class 4 effects. And as a result, we find that amiodarone is effective for a wide variety of, of uh, arrhythmias, uh, including supraventricular tachycardias, PVCs, VTAC, and even defibrillation-resistant VFib. Also, it's notable that amiodarone can be used for conversion of atrial fibrillation. Most of the drugs that we talk about are given to control the rate of atrial fibrillation. So the patient will still be in atrial fibrillation, but with a slower heart rate. Amiodarone is the exception in that it not only can give rate control, but may actually give rhythm control and convert the patient from atrial fibrillation into a sinus rhythm. Other drugs in this class are listed here, although most of them are not commonly used or widely available anymore. The dosing for amiodarone depends on the indication. So in the case of a non-life-threatening arrhythmia, the goal is to get in 1,000 milligrams over 24 hours. And this is commonly done with a 10-minute loading dose of 150 milligrams. Then 360 milligrams given over 6 hours, so that's a milligram per minute. And then the remainder given over 18 hours at about half a milligram per minute. In patients who are in cardiac arrest, like a pulseless VTAC or VFib, we just give 300 milligrams as an IV push. Now, amiodarone has a very long elimination half-time of 29 days. It has a large volume of distribution with extensive protein binding, and so the, dr the drug really does hang around for a long time. It also has an interesting constellation of side effects, including lung injury in the form of pneumonitis, hypotension due to vasodilation, photosensitivity, a skin rash, and it can cause hypo or hyperthyroidism. Note that the IOD in amiodarone indicates the high iodine content in that drug. We'll stop here for this video. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we'll continue in the next segment.